welcome to those who have joined us so far. I'm sure people will continue to trickle in, but at the moment we'll get started. So thank you again for joining us today on the River Basin Management Society's first webinar for the 2020-2021 financial year on data visualisation for the water industry. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. So we acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first peoples and original custodians of Australia's lands and waters and honour their elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and respect their continuing deep spiritual connection that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have to country and their unique ability to care for country. And today, as I'm calling in from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So a little bit about the River Basin Management Society. We are a diverse community of practice in Australia. We are dedicated to connecting people and sharing knowledge in integrated catchment management. We were established in 1986 and we are driven by our members and supported by an elected volunteer committee. We invite new members to join us and we now have a new website. Even if you'd like to check it out, please head to www.rbms.org.au to find out more or become a member. So your host today. So my name is Janice Taylor, I'm the Victorian chapter lead and I'll be moderating this session. We have Jess Walker, our Vice President, and we have our Technical Lead, Brad Klingen, assisting. Today's guest speakers. So to begin with, we'll be hearing from Rain Consulting. They are a new and highly regarded urban water management consultancy. They're comprised of their directors and principal engineers, Rianda Mills and Luke Cunningham. They were established in 2019, and with decades of experience between them, in surface water management, integrated water management, urban stormwater and flood management. They'll be presenting today on art versus science, parlez-vous français. In their time as engineers, they have seen the good, the bad and the ugly examples of data representation. Today, they'll be discussing their style and how they take, in, how they take complex data and transform it into a beautiful and simply translated format. Following RAIN Consulting, we'll be hearing from the Karangamite CMA. Part of their key responsibility is to manage the delivery of environmental water to the Mirabal, the Upper Barwon and Lower Barwon wetlands. In mid-2019, they began exploring the concept of online data visualisation as a feature for their new website and to improve their water literacy and community engagement in their Water for Environment program. So this was led by Sarah Martin in their communications and engagement team and Sharon Blum-Cohen as part of their estuaries and environmental water team. And it was helped brought to life with the expertise from Discovery AI. Which leads us to our final presentation, which will be via Christian Borovac, who is also a member of a River Basin Management Society committee. He is also the director and co-founder of Discovery AI. He focuses on using clever communication methods and visual tools to effectively deliver a message. So through his experience as an environmental engineer, he has navigated through the realms and ever-changing platform of the business intelligence tool, Microsoft Power BI, a great low-code alternative for processing, analyzing, and communicating a wide range of data sets. So today, Christian will be helping explain Power BI and show examples of how it has been applied across the water industry to inform decision-making within various organizations. So I'd like to welcome all our speakers today and everyone else who has joined us for this webinar session and I would like to hand it over now to oh actually sorry I've missed one more thing just some housekeeping um, so on our Q&A zoom features so all attendees as you'll note are on mute for the duration of the webinar uh, and if you'd like to ask a question please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and not the chat or the raise hand function uh, if you would like to you can also upvote questions so these are just just to reduce the duplication um, and any questions that aren't responded to today will be responded to offline and sent to all registered attendees with a webinar recording at a later date. Um, but each presentation will have a few minutes at the end to answer questions as we go. So now I'd like to hand it over to Rianda and Luke, if you'd like to share your screen. Thanks, Janice.
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Janice. Um, and of course, a big thank you to the IBMS for inviting us to present at today's session. It's a real pleasure to be able to be here today um, and to share with you something we're quite passionate about at RAIN Consulting. Um, and we're really also looking forward to the presentations to follow. Um, so as Janice outlined, RAIN Consulting is a relatively new um, company. We were formed in 2019, so last year. Um, however, Luke and I at this point have a, have a few years under our belt in the water industry in Victoria at this point. Cool, next slide. So our presentation today, Art versus Science, Parle vous français. Does your audience speak French? I don't, but it sounds really nice. The chances are a small percentage may, but the vast majority probably don't. And this is why we think that good visualisation techniques are so important. So if you do it well, it has the power to make complex scientific information accessible to a much wider audience so that everyone can make their own conclusions from the work. So, you know, obviously as engineers, we're obviously always dealing with complex data. Um, and solutions. So by putting some thought behind it, we can provide it to the reader in a beautiful and simply translated format. So today we'll discuss why our style is important to us and share some of our tips and tricks. And I really hope you get a lot out of it. We're going to provide a few examples um, of where we've had a bit of fun in translating the information and we'll do our best to explain our thought processes along the way. And importantly, um, the visualisations that we'll be showing today are all generated using freeware. So we think it's something that, that should be able to be accessible to, to everyone. Uh, really, imagination is the only limitation with this stuff. So a quick overview, we'll be providing a, um, going through a Lego style map that we put together uh, just for a bit of fun. We'll also be showing you something we developed using um, Flourish Studios, which was an interesting way to represent Melbourne rainfall totals for the past few years. And finally, we'll give you a few examples of just really, you know, bog standard um, modelling maps that we think, you know, are quite pretty that we, we put in our engineering reports. Okay, thanks, Rianda. Um, so, we're going to start off with some of these Lego maps and what are they? They're topographic maps, um, obviously, here of Australia and Victoria. Um, but the question you're probably thinking is why? Um, why would we want to make Lego maps of Australia? Well, A, it was a bit of fun, but we saw a similar map someone created on LinkedIn and they used Esri, which is another GIS platform, uh, to create a cross-stitch style map of Scotland. We really liked it and thought we could try a Lego version. And after a little bit of Googling, we realized we weren't actually the first to think of this, but there was no Australian examples we could find. Um, there was no distinct project we we're working on here. It was just a bit of fun. We thought if our kids can play with Lego all day, why can't we? Um, we like that uh, similar to other good topographical maps, the elevation legend, which we've got on the side in little Lego blocks uh, becomes redundant as the map starts to tell the story itself. And that's what um, a lot of today is about, is about how we're telling our story. All of this is produced in QGIS, um, as Rianda mentioned, it's freeware. So how did we do it? Uh, so we took the one second elevation data from uh, the NASA's shuttle radar topography mission. So one second data is roughly about a 30 meter grid resolution. Uh, then within QGIS, we created an 80 meter grid across all of Australia. Uh, this was a little bit of trial and error to get the Lego blocks looking the right scale when we zoomed out. For the Victoria map, uh, we used much smaller grids, but 80 metres was about right. Um, so then using the uh, STRM data, SRTM data, we assigned an elevation to each of those uh, little squares and selected the maximum elevation within that cell to, to be represented. Then it was time to get creative. Uh, we played with the block colours shading and uh, worked out a way to add the little Lego stud to the top of each piece. Um, and then finally played around with the sizes and the shades of the shadows until it looked realistic at the scale we wanted. So 
basically what we ended up with was just a different way of showing it, um, the topography of Australia. And for me, Luke generated this map, but when I, when I saw it, I was immediately drawn in and had a really quick understanding of, um, you know, where the high points in the country are and, and alternatively the low points. Um, obviously, you know, the raw SRTM data um, is a really nice map as well and it's useful for seeing exactly where the, you know, the waterways are and so on. Um, but something about the Lego map just really, uh, I guess, drew the eye and gave me a different sort of understanding. So we posted those elevation maps on LinkedIn and we had some great feedback, including a request to do the same, but with rainfall data. Well, given our name of Rain Consulting, we couldn't say no to that one. So here's two examples of how we attempted to tell the story of monthly average rainfall distribution across all of Australia for 2019. So this first example we've got here is sort of a, a calendar-like format, I guess, um, through each month. Um, we like that you can quickly identify the wet and dry seasons across Australia, particularly in the north, just at a glance. The second was to combine all the maps into a bit of an animation showing the change over time. So we'll let this play through for the year, but you can sort of see how it changes over time. You see the dry areas where it's all white. Um, and we're not exactly sure which format we like better, um, but we like them both. So there we go through to December. So the next example um, we'll show you was, was generated using some freeware called Flourish. Um, and just a disclaimer, we don't have any shares or anything in these companies. We just think they're really great. And um, we'll be using a lot more of them, I think, going forward ourselves. So we found that, you know, Flourish is it's easy to, to upload your data. Um, you can create really, uh, really beautiful visualisations very easily. There's a whole range of different options. Um, and you can even create sort of short, short videos and things. I think we'll be using it in future for a lot of our stakeholder engagement and facilitation work um, and maybe to summarise and present sort of polling results and things like that. I think it'll be useful. So we'll have a bit of fun playing with that. So <clears throat> again, back on LinkedIn, someone posted something about how wet the year had been to date in Melbourne. This was back in uh, late April. So we've had a really wet start to, uh, to the year in Melbourne. The attempt was, um, didn't show up very well. It was lots of um, line graphs showing the last sort of, I think, 10 years or so. Um, Rounder and I spent a bit of time staring at the line graph and trying to interpret it. And we thought the message was really important, but we'd lose that the message was going to be lost on the, the non-technical audience quite quickly. So the story was there, but it wasn't being well illustrated. Um, so we'd seen these chasing bar type graphs, which has become a bit of a, a fad on um, a Reddit board that I follow called Data is Beautiful. Um, we decided to give it a shot with the data. Uh, this, what this is going to do is compare the last six years of cumulative rainfall um, to the end of April 2020. So here's the finished product. So you can see all the years here. So they're shifting around with total cumulative rainfall and 2020 early hits the lead. And you can see the other years below just jostling for position. And you've got the date counter here. So heading through April, still way out in front 2020. And this is where our data stopped. When we, we did this analysis, we do plan to update it. Um, so you can now what we're going to do is we look here, we've got 377 mils is where we got to at the end of April there. And we'll just watch how long it takes to catch up in the other years. 2016 and 2017 are battling it out here. And then it's not until sort of very late in August that we accumulate the same amount of rainfall as we, we um, accumulated in early 2020. Now, as we sort of move into October, November, December, all the other years start to catch up a little bit. Um, so like I said, we're really keen to uh, update this very shortly. Um, all the data here is from the Bureau of Meteorology, which is publicly available. Um, and again, we're using Flourish. Um, so as Rianda said, in Flourish, you just load everything into like an Excel format. It's really easy to play around with and then change the colours, add your logos, uh, change the fonts, all those sort of things. So, very user friendly. So now we'll take you through um, a few examples of maps that we've uh, generated for our reports. Um, and I think a really important 
uh, point for us here is that, you know, obviously we spend a lot of time and a lot of money on producing really technically um, correct or, you know, quality assured, good work, good engineering and science work. Um, and then we can kind of rush the end product in a way, you know, just throw a map together and put that in the report when really that that is, you know, a big part of the product of our work and a, and a big thing that the client needs to be able to take and understand and use and present themselves. So we really feel that if you're going to spend a lot of time on doing the work, then you should spend a nice chunk of time on working out how you're going to present the work at the end. Um, I, I really love this map. I think it's the colours are just very beautiful and they draw you in again. Um, and a, couple, a bit of the thinking behind this, and it may seem obvious, but really it is worth um, articulating what it is that makes a map like this work so well. Um, first of all, you know, the, the title bar down the bottom, it's just monochromatic, simple, black and white. The North Arrow is very simple, the scale is simple. We've listed the data sources there as well. Uh, we've kept the, the streets and the cadastre and a very, very sort of greys and whites, very muted, so it sits in the background. Um, there are some contours on this map, but it's not the main point of the map. So they're there for reference if we want to get a feel for the topography, but, you know, it's not that important. So again, they're sort of greyed out and they're colourful. It's a beautiful rainbow of contours. What we really want to get out of this map is to understand, you know, how this two flow model was um, specified, how it was set up. So we can see the boundary clearly, we can uh, see the roughness map for all the, all the parcels there, we can see the pipes and the pits. Um, and that's, that's what we want to understand in the site boundary there in yellow. Okay, and on to another example here. So um, this is a style of map that we in-house call Triple Trouble. So we are often asked to complete flood mitigation modelling projects. Um, and this is an example of a recent project we completed uh, somewhere in Melbourne. Um, so generally in a flood mitigation report, you'll want to display three separate maps, one showing the current conditions, the next showing how things would look if mitigation works were completed, and the third showing the benefit or the impact of the works. When you read these reports, has Luke dropped out for people? Yeah, okay, I'll pick up from here. So um, as Luke said, we've got the triple trouble map here. Um, on the left, we've got no mitigation. In the centre, we've got a mitigation option. Um, oh, you can, Luke, are you back? I think I'll continue talking. And then we've got a depth difference plot on the right. Sorry, did I cut out for a second there, did I? Yeah, and I think we've lost your screen as well, Luke. Okay, one second. Um, bear with me. Okay, have you got me again? Uh, you're on mute, Rianda. We've just got the view with the notes on the screen. Oh. Apologies for that. Uh, Rianda, would you just jump in and let me know where we got up to with this one? I was just repeating what you said. <laughs> okay, so where were we up to just there? Uh, okay, so we're up to, uh, so on this one, we just want to talk a little bit quickly about the aesthetics. So, what we'd usually have is the street names marked and uh, the locations of well-known buildings. Um, we've stripped all these off for the, this presentation because um, the site's a little bit sensitive. Um, but there's often a temptation to throw in an aerial photo or a map of some form in the background. You'll notice for this one, uh, we've selected a very simple colour scheme for the base map, which is just grey for the roads, white for the, the properties. And there's a bit of a rose colour there for the building outlines. Um, we think it does the job whilst not detracting from what you're meant to be looking at, which is the results. Um, then just a point on the map itself. So the results themselves, sorry. So these are depth, so flood depth uh, results here. Um, we're using a sort of a simple light yellow through to a dark blue scale. Um, often uh, in flood modelling, uh, people use a blue, uh, black, light blue to dark blue colour ramp that's built into the GIS packages, which can be really hard to pull apart by the eye. 
Um, a really good resource is a website called Colour Brewer. So I'm just going to take you there now and give you a demonstration of Colour Brewer. So you can see the web address at the top. It's C-L-O-R, so that way, brewer2.org. So what you do is you pick the number of data classes you have. So you can have up to 12. Let's go with nine. And you pick what sort of nature of your data. So is it sequential data? Is it diverging? Or is it just qualitative? Um, and then you can play with your color. So pick one that you like. I think you'll notice there that's the one we're using for our depth maps. Um, and these are ones that you can really, uh, really start to pull out the, the different colors with your eyes really easily. There's also some options down the side here if you've got, if you need your report to be colorblind safe, print friendly, photocopy safe. And then all you do in your GIS package, you can grab these hex codes and your GIS package will read those codes in as the colors. You can also have them as RGB or CMYK as well. So we use uh, Color Brew a lot. We really recommend it. It's a great little uh, website. So this is our final example. Uh, often at the start of one, our, of one of our reports, we like to describe the area of interest. Um, and surface elevation is an important thing. Now we could make a really simple map with the terrain shaded light to dark or a simple labeled contours sort of map like the one on the screen now and export it for the report in under 10 minutes. It's gonna do the job, absolutely, but would it stand out in the report and make the reader stop to take notice of it compared to the hundreds of other elevation plots they've seen in reports in the past? In this uh, example we're gonna show you, we've used the Pantone color charts to select some really nice colors rather than using the Color Brewer website we just showed you. So this first map, uh, on the left here is the first example uh, where we've selected different color ramp here um, to sort of show what's going on. We think it looked okay, but it wasn't totally self-explanatory. We then took the colors and sorted them by eye uh, into a color ramp to produce this second image. Uh, while it might not say too much more than your traditional elevation map, we think it looks pretty ace. So if you're looking for some nice color shades, Google Pantone colors, that's P-A-N-T-O-N-E, and have a play around. There's plenty there. Um, thanks, Luke. And I'd, I'd like to sort of argue that uh, actually I do get a lot out of that second map where you've got, you know, you can stare at that, you can see straight away the higher areas in the red and the lower areas in the white. Whereas the first contour map that you brought up, you really do have to study it and look at the numbers to work out what's going on with the contouring. Um, we, I, I really like this particular one. And earlier in the year, I'm sure some of you are aware, uh, Melbourne Water had the Art of Modelling competition. So we entered this one in there back in the days when you could leave your house. And um, here it is in the foyer with Luke next to his map. So, um, I hope that you you know you've you've got a little bit out of a little bit out of that today. I think it's really important for us in the area of science and engineering to be able to present information in an engaging way to a really wide audience. I was having a chat to someone on the weekend who might be in this session today actually who pointed out that you know there is a bit of a divergence at the moment um, between from from science uh, through politics um, it's a bit of a bit of a divergence away from the science and then the engineering so I think it's really important that we all continue to engage uh, engage our audiences and and make people feel that they're able to connect um, with the technical work that we do particularly moving forward um, with climate change and so on and Luke Thank you. So um, we share a lot of tips and tricks uh, on our LinkedIn page and our Instagram pages. So please come, come by and give us a follow and the details are on the screen now. Um, we also wanted to take the opportunity as well to comment on uh, the current situation. So we're all in various forms of lockdown at the moment and it's probably very fair to say that nobody's nailing things at the moment. So well done in coming along today and listening and spending some time improving your own knowledge base. We really hope you found it interesting. So thanks again for listening along. Stay safe and we're happy to take on any questions now. Thanks for that, Luke and Rianda. That was amazing to listen to and really interesting actually. So this is like a very brand new area for me myself. So it's great to, um, to learn something new. I really do appreciate it as I'm sure everyone does. So oh, we do sure. have a couple of Q and A's. 
Um, if anyone has any more, don't forget to submit them via the Q&A function, not the chat or the hands up. So I've got the first one here is from Iris. Uh, she may have missed something at the very beginning. Are those Lego maps made from a software? If it is, which software is that? Thank you. Sure. Uh, great question, Iris. Uh, it's in QGIS. Uh, QGIS is a, a freeware GIS mapping uh, package. It's, it's very good. Um, there was a, there's a lot of steps in producing those Lego maps and it was just a little bit of creativity of um, creating the little blocks and then putting little circles on top to make them look like the studs and things like that. But it was no other sort of software script or anything like that. It was just sort of fumbling our way through it to a degree. Great, thank you for that, Luke. Uh, another one is, I think you did say this, uh, that Flourish is free. Yes, to a degree, I believe. Yep, to a degree, yep. They love <laughs> like the chasing things. bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was actually probably my favorite one was the, the chasing bar graph. I thought that was really interesting to see how wet 2020 has been in comparison to a lot of our other wet years in, in the past and how yeah. it took a time for catching up. Yeah, we, we felt like it's a, a nice way of telling that story um, there. So, you know, um, taking that data and really making it easy to digest. Um, I know we both shared it with our families as well and um, not engineers and they all understood it as well. So, yeah. Uh, I've got a question here from Shandy. Sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. Uh, how do Lego maps add value differently as compared to contour maps? Do you want to go around or should I? Oh, I just think for me personally, mm. I mean, like I said there, you know, we have the two different examples. Um, yeah, you, could, you can see where the high points are and with the low, where the low points are. One, it's different. And so you just look at it. And I mean, I'm not saying that we all need to put Lego maps in our scientific reports unless you've got a particularly, you know, well-humoured client that you might be doing. <laughs> but it is just, it's just fun. If, if, there's, if there's space for fun, if it's going to be engaging and draw people in, then why not? Yeah. Uh, and just to add on to that, thank you, was I'm sort of going to maybe combine these two. Um, how did you generate your contours for the last map? And somebody else has also added just on top of that, have you considered 3D Lego maps yet? Okay, so for this uh, last one here, uh, so, the contours are from LIDAR, so that's the aerial uh, survey, and that's as a, a raster grid, so three-dimensional grid there. Uh, so they've been, you can see on the, the colour scale uh, on the side, uh, they've been classed into one metre intervals, so that's just um, within, within QGIS, you can just sort of say between 117 and 118 metres HD, give me the yellow colour. So we just populated all those colours one by one, uh, put them in the order we liked and um, yeah went with it from there um, to sort of play around with it we did uh, like Rihanna said we sort of played around with it a bit moved them around um, did it by eye to a degree until we thought it looked right um, and then with the the 3d lego maps that's um, for sure um, Something I'd be interested in, in learning more about, I think. Um, they, they've got a certain three-dimensional aspect to them at the moment. Um, but, yeah, being able to sort of tilt and pan on it would be a, a very nice little feature if we could work that one out one day. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Maybe one day when we're jealous of our kids playing Lego again, we'll jump in and, and give that a crack. That's awesome. Thanks, Luke. <laughs> Um, I'll leave with one more um, and then the rest will have to get answered offline, unfortunately, so we can keep on time. Um, I'll just have a quick look again. Let's have a look here from Lindsay. Was the mitigation option on your triple trouble map obvious? I thought it didn't really stand out as much as I expected. However, I like the display. All right, let's have a look again. So on this one, we've got, um, so no mitigation on one side, then mitigation. So I think probably one thing to note on this is that the mitigation solution that we were trialling in this one didn't completely work because there's obviously still a bit of water lying around. Um, and the difference plot at the end just shows a pretty modest reduction in water levels. Um, 
So I think, uh, I guess what we were trying to tell in the story here is you can, if you start on the, in the first panel, you can say, okay, there's quite a bit of flooding. Then you move your eyes to the second one. You can clearly see, okay, there's a reduction in, in flooding for sure. I can see that. And particularly if you lived in one of these properties, you could say, okay, great, that's a bit of a reduction. And then the third one, um, it is a little bit tougher to, to um, get this one across, um, but we've got a colour scale range of um, differences. So where it's a, a minus, it means um, that we've had a flood depth reduction, so we've improved conditions. And when it's a pink, uh, things have, have got worse. Um, so we can clearly show that it's, it's provided a benefit, it's reduced, and then we just need to read off sort of what sort of range are in there. It's um, between five and 10 centimetres, so it's not fantastic, um, but it's, it's worthwhile. But obviously that comes back to, uh, I guess, what the mitigation solution was and how much was being spent on that. And um, so this particular option was just a quick fix type of option to, to make a, a quick little benefit. Um, but hopefully that helps clarify that map a little bit. That's great. Thanks for that, Luke. And thank you to both you and Rounder for that presentation. That was really, really great insights. We shall now move on to Sharon and Sarah if they would like to share their screen.